Hi, this is Robert Rapier from R Squared, and this is R Squared Energy TV. On this week's episode, I'm going to do the first of a series of mini presentations on the topic of energy. Uh, these presentations will be three to five slides, just go into a little bit more detail on some energy topic of interest. This week, I'll be talking about energy return on energy invested, how it's used, how it can be misused, and some of the things that you need to be aware of as you, as you discuss this. So what is energy return on energy invested? It is essentially the energy that is consumed in the production of energy. So say you're producing oil. You have to spend energy on the electricity. You have to spend energy to ship the oil around by ship, by truck, what, whatever, however it gets around, you're consuming energy. So if you consumed one BTU of energy to produce 20 BTUs of oil, your energy return on energy invested is 20 to 1. So it's the energy that's, that's uh, the net energy available at the end, not net energy, sorry, net energy is the energy out, usable energy out, minus the energy consumed. So in this case, our energy return on energy invested is 20 BTUs out divided by one BTU that's consumed for an EROEI of 20 to 1. The net energy in this case is a 20 BTUs out minus the one BTU that was consumed in the production of the energy. So some of the caveats that you need to be aware of. Um, first of all, global EROEI is declining and that means that a hundred years ago it's often said that it would take one BTU of energy to produce a hundred BTUs of oil. That has declined as we've had to go out and drill deeper wells and move offshore. Uh, produce some unconventional oil, the biofuels, all those are lower and the, the EROEI is going down. The good news on that is this will be a job creator potentially because it will take more people to produce energy as the EROEI declines and I'll, I'll get to that on the next slide here. The bad news is, and, and this slide demonstrates it, as we go down an EROEI and we get down in the range of tar sands, the range of biofuels, you have to produce more and more gross energy just to produce the same net. So on this particular slide, I'm looking at the gross production to maintain 85 million net barrels of oil. So if we're looking at conventional oil, and I'm assuming this is going all the way to final product fuel. So I'm taking oil all the way from oil in the ground to gasoline. And that's gonna be somewhere probably on the lower end here, eight to one maybe. The, the oil production step is maybe 20 to one, and then you're about uh, 10 to one on the refining step. You put all those together and you end up somewhere eight to one. Um, you, you do tar sands, the tar sands extraction is more energy intensive, and so you're probably down in the four to five range. Biofuels, uh, even more intensive, you have to go out and grow crops, you have to put fertilizer down, all these things. And as you move down, as you see and when you're using conventional oil, you don't have to produce that much more than 85 million barrels a day to net 85. You're going to produce uh, you know, maybe 90 and you're going to consume 5 to have a net of 85. But as you move down, and let's say we get down in the range of you know, corn ethanol, maybe, maybe 2 to 1, to produce 85 million net barrels worth of oil a day, you would, have to, you would have to produce 175 gross, I mean, uh, sorry, 170 gross. So that would be 85 consumed in the production to have 85 left over. Now, if you, if you follow energy, you, you know that it's probably not going to be possible to produce 170 million net barrels of oil. So what this says is it becomes harder and harder just to maintain as the energy return on energy invested declines. And that's the purpose of this graph, is just to show uh, it's going to take more effort from society, more energy from society, more people, just to produce the same amount of energy as the energy return declines. However, there are a number of caveats, and we have to be very careful how we use energy return on energy invested. Uh, the, probably the biggest criticism is that projects don't care about EROEI, they care about economics, and this is true. A process can have a poor energy return and still be economical. An example would be if I had a process to convert two BTUs of coal into one BTU of ethanol. Well, my energy return on energy invested is less than one. 
which is the break-even point for a sustainable process. If a process with all the energy inputs included has an energy return above one, it is potentially sustainable, and if it's below one, it's not. So um, a, a, a process, you know, even the processes that are above one may not be sustainable in their present form because they're reliant on fossil fuels, but they could be potentially sustainable if they're above one. But in the case of uh, two BTUs of coal, one BTU of ethanol, my energy return is 0.5 and my net energy is negative one. I've destroyed one BTU of energy, but that BTU of ethanol is worth a lot more than the two BTUs of coal. So the economics would say, we'll do that process, uh, where the energy return may say you would not do that process. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest concerns of mine is there is no time component in energy return. So think about finance. If I told you you were getting a 3% return on an investment, what do you want to know? You want to know, well, first of all, you want to know the risk, but you also want to know the time frame over that, that, that investment's gonna, gonna return that. So if it's 3% a day, it's very different than if it's gonna be 3% a year. And so when you're talking about EROEI numbers, it's very important to make sure that two processes are compared on the same time basis. You know, a process with an EROEI of two to one that can return that every day is superior to one that's 10 to one that only returns that once a year. Um, another caveat is that biomass inputs are frequently omitted. So, so for sugarcane ethanol, for instance, the energy return is not really eight to one as is often quoted. It's lower than that, but that's the fossil return. So for one BTU of fossil input, you get eight back. Uh, but, but the big energy input there is bagasse, the, the sugarcane residue, and that's free energy. Uh, they end up with it at the plant, it's washed, and so they use it for process energy. But it's not the true energy return on energy invested. Um, you have to be careful there if you're using biomass and they're omitting that because you have to ask the question, is there a better usage of the biomass? And this is where you know, subsidies and mandates can distort the, uh, the, the, the economics of a process but the EROEI will tell you this process is viable or not viable in the long term if we're talking about fungible fuels. So we're talking about converting a fuel, let's say, let's just make it gasoline and ethanol. You wouldn't convert one BTU of gasoline into one BTU of ethanol. You could have subsidies to distort that and make it economical, but if you look at it, you're converting equal fuels um, and, and, and you wouldn't do that. For, that's not good energy policy. So. Energy return on energy invested can tell you, is this a process that can be viable in the long run? No, no subsidies, uh, no mandates. Last caveat is that inputs and consumed energy are often, confl are often conflated. So sometimes you hear people say that the energy return for ethanol is better than for gasoline. They come up with this by conflating, they're, they're comparing apples and oranges. They're comparing the oil that goes into the refinery and they're treating that as consumed energy. So what they really have, they're measuring an efficiency for gasoline and an energy return for ethanol. On an apples to apples basis, the energy return for gasoline, as back on that other slide, is, is probably in the six to eight to one range. Energy return for ethanol is you know one and a half, maybe two. So the bottom line on energy return on energy invested, it's a very useful tool, but you have to know how to use it and you really should understand the caveats. So with that, that's the first mini presentation. Look forward to seeing you next week.